We thank you for your word already, but can we ever thank you enough? We are not as knowledgeable of your word as we should be. So please help us. Give us a desire to know it. Help us to have it come to our remembrance, Lord, in the right time and in the right ways and circumstances. Help us to be better at sharing it courageously with others. Give us knowledge and wisdom and understanding in it to illuminate our minds. Help it to make a, a new impact on us, like the light bulb come on in new ways for us. And continue to guide us in your word and help us to do it when we hear it in Jesus' name. Amen. Speaking of following God's word, <laughs> we kind of have an example of someone either doing that or not doing that today in Isaiah 39. This takes part after the miraculous recovery of Hezekiah that we talked about last week. If you remember last week, the Lord heard Hezekiah's prayer and God gave him 15 more years of life. But what does Hezekiah do with that, right? God has given him 15 more years of life. What a blessing. What does Hezekiah do with that? Will he use it well? Will he live in wisdom to the glory of God? Or will he use it in another way? Well, as we go through Isaiah 39, something will become more and more clear. And here are some verses outside of Isaiah 39 that will give you a hint of what Hezekiah will give in to. So I'm just going to give you three verses, and these are what these verses are talking about are hints of what Hezekiah will give in to, okay? So Proverbs 11, verse 2. When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with the humble there is wisdom. Proverbs 16, verse 18. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. We've heard that one before, right? Maybe you didn't know it was a proverb. Pride goes before the fall. Proverbs 29, verse 23. One's pride will bring him low. But he who is lowly in spirit, another way of saying humble, will obtain honor. Did you pick up on the hints at all of what Hezekiah might be battling here in Isaiah 39? Let's read verse 1. At that time, Merodach, Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon. Now I'm talking about Babylon, not Assyria anymore. This is Babylon. King of Babylon sent envoys with letters and a present to Hezekiah. For he had heard that he had been sick and had recovered. The king of Babylon sends a letter and present to King Hezekiah. This is a gesture of kindness from the king of Babylon, right? He, hey, you're a fellow monarch. I'm just showing my concern, my general concern. Good, good on you, right? Be no different than a president hearing that, oh, the, the prime minister of Sweden is sick, and then he gets better. And you send him a present, and you send him a letter, right? Kind of, kind of along the same lines. He's fellow royalty. This is because the presence of Merodach Baladan, because he was there, because the son of the king was there, this is more than just a general courtesy, though. This isn't just a tip of the hat and a nod. This is more than that. This is an attempt to bring the kingdom of Judah on the side of Babylon. This is because Babylon was against Assyria. So we've been talking about Assyria pretty much the entire time up until this point. Now we read of Babylon. To the Assyrians, Baladan was a terrorist. He was uh, devoted to the liberation of the Babylonians from the Assyrians. At this time, Assyria was a superpower, and Babylon would be a, like a level below that. They're not a superpower, but they are a threat. And of course, at this time, Hezekiah is tremendously worried about Assyria himself. So to have this envoy from Babylon come all of a sudden with a letter and with a gift, you can see how that would be appealing to him, how he would feel honored by that. Because 
In the grand scheme of things, Assyria is a superpower, Babylon's just underneath that, and then you have Judah well underneath that. So he would feel quite honored by that, and he gladly welcomed the honor or the envoys of the enemies of Assyria. He welcomed these men from Babylon. Notice that in the chapters that we've read before this, when stuff was happening, Hezekiah went to Isaiah. Hezekiah went to the Lord. He does no such thing here. Here he doesn't go and, and consult with the Lord. He doesn't go and consult with Isaiah. He ends up doing something foolish because of that. He ends up showing them Judah's vast treasures, the treasures of Jerusalem. All of his supplies, all of his military strength. He shows all his cards, which ends up being a bad thing. See, God had given Hezekiah and Judah great wealth. And so when they came, these ambassadors of Babylon, he's kind of getting a little puffed up, right? Hey, these guys who are more important than we are are showing me some attention, stroking the old ego, right? So he wants to impress them. So he shows them the great wealth that God has given them. Shows them everything. Shows, like I said, all his cards. And we see in Chronicles 32, 2 Chronicles 32, that they're impressed. Hey, quite a bit of stuff here. Nice kingdom you have here, right? The first part of Isaiah chapters 1 through 38 mostly dealt with the Assyrians, right? And we're still in that phase where the Assyrian army is a threat. The Hezekiah has just been healed. The Assyrian army is still a threat. We're kind of bouncing back and forth in time. We talked about before about God delivering Judah and Jerusalem from the Assyrians. We've talked about Hezekiah being sick before that happened. And now we're kind of in that same timeline, right? So don't get confused. We're just bouncing back and forth in time. You're not crazy. We're just bouncing back and forth in time in the story. So the first part of Isaiah, 1 through 38, those chapters deal with mostly the Assyrian Empire. We've talked a little bit about Edom. We've talked a little bit about uh, Egypt and stuff too. But primarily, it was the Assyrian threat. The rest of Isaiah, now through chapter 66, will prophetically speak to the coming threat of the Babylonian Empire. You can separate Isaiah into two sections that way. <clears throat> so you can actually look at this chapter as kind of an introductory chapter to the rest of Isaiah. It will also focus on, it's not all about Babylon, it will also focus on the coming of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, now through the rest of Isaiah. Finally, we can move on to verse 2 here. This is Hezekiah uh, actually entertaining these envoys. It says, and Hezekiah welcomed them gladly, and he showed them his treasure house. The silver, the gold, the spices, the precious oil, the whole armory. It's all his weaponry. All that was found in his storehouses, there was nothing, there was nothing in his house or in all his realm that Hezekiah did not show them. Showed him everything. Look at it all. I'm holding nothing back. Again, you can imagine that this was very flattering for King Hezekiah, right? After all, Judah's low down on a totem pole. And they're being, uh, you know, Babylon's a, a, a mini superpower, and they're paying attention to this little nobody nation. He's flattered by this. He's receiving notice and recognition from the king of Babylon, and so that would make King Hezekiah feel pretty important, right? In gratitude, Hezekiah shows him everything. <laughs> Hey, you, you know, you said a few nice things about me. You're showing me some love and attention. Here's everything I've got. <laughs> Excuse me. He wants to please them. He wants to impress them. That's all part of P-R-I-D-E, pride. The hints that Proverbs were talking about. So he does everything he can to impress them, Right? Shows them the very best of everything. Shows them his entire realm, his whole household. There's nothing in the house of his entire realm that he does not show them. Bless you. 
And now there's going to be a coming rebuke. <laughs> if you wonder if that was a good thing or not, there's going to be a coming rebuke from Isaiah that will demonstrate that this is pride, this is foolishness on King Hezekiah's part. He's in the dangerous place of wanting to please and impress. But here's the real problem with that. Who he wants to please and impress. He's not trying to please God. He's trying to please man. He's trying to impress man. Nothing you do will impress God, right? All our righteous works are like filthy rags to him. But we can try and please him. We can live to please him. And that's who you should be living to please. Because if you live to please him, the trickle-down effect will work out for everybody else underneath God. Right? If I live to please God, I will certainly please my wife. If I live to please God, I will please my children. If I live to please God, I will please my, my employer. I should not live to please man, though. That flips it on its head. It puts God nowhere near the top. So he's literally wanting, after receiving this recognition, to continue to receive praise and adoration from them, recognition from the king of Babylon. Not only is it bad to seek uh, to be, uh, it's, it's bad to seek to impress man. It's bad to seek to please man. It's even worse to want to please and impress an ungodly man. The king of Babylon is certainly no godly man. Neither were his son or his envoys. But Hezekiah receives all this attention wrongly, right? He could have had an opportunity to share. Look at what the Lord God of Israel has done. He is the only one and true living God, right? And he has blessed us. There was no need for him to have to show them everything. But what an opportunity for him to share the blessings of what the Lord has done. Oh, and by the way, you know, yeah, we've got Assyria outside our gates, you know, coming this way, but we're not worried because we have the one true living God on our side. Missed opportunity. Missed opportunity because he's too busy focused on himself. That's what King Hezekiah is doing. He let all his attention go to his head. He got puffed up. He got puffed up. It can be dangerous when people compliment or recognize us, and then we take that praise, we take those compliments, and we let it go to our heads. You start to believe the hype, right? We see that happen with uh, movie stars or especially like sports athletes and stuff, and you'll see sometimes where they let it go to their heads. It never works out well when they do, does it? No different here. In this place of wanting to please man instead of God, Hezekiah isn't serving God, right? You can't serve yourself and God. You can only have one master. Who is the master in your life? Is it you? And you just give God lip service? Or is it truly God? Who's making the decisions in your life? Who guides it? Who are you living to please? Yourself or God? Simple question. But a good litmus test that we must always be asking ourselves, right? To make sure that we never get too far off the path. Paul wrote in Galatians 1.10, For if I still pleased men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Paul gets it. I'm a servant of Christ. He's my master. I serve him. Not my own desires, not my own interests, not my own pride. I serve him. So it's no longer what I want. It's what he wants. It's no longer my dreams. They're his dreams. It's no longer my future. It's his future. It's no longer my desires. It's his desires. You ask yourself every moment of every day, what is God's will? What does God want in this situation? Because he has bought me. I have been bought with his blood. Paul gets it. When we leave to please man, we cannot at the same time please and serve God. If you're serving or pleasing men, no matter how you frame it, you're ultimately not serving God. You're serving yourself because there's something that you're trying to get out of it. Right? Hezekiah wants, likes the attention he likes being puffed up. He likes all this honoring that's happening. So, that's what he does. When he chooses to do that, he's not serving God. 
He's serving himself because what he's doing doesn't benefit God. It doesn't benefit God's kingdom or his people. It only benefits Hezekiah. We can do the very same thing. We must be aware of that and weary of that. Just as Samson revealed his strength to Delilah, so Hezekiah reveals God's glory to these ungodly men from Babylon. Certainly he was hoping to win even more favor from them. What should have Hezekiah said to the, to the envoys? Well, how about thanks for coming? Appreciate your gift. You know? Good on you. You're, and again, like I said before, look at the wonders of what our God has done. Look at how he's protected us from uh, the Assyrians. We continue to believe that he'll continue to protect us from him, from the Assyrians. Look at all the, you know, it doesn't have to show them all the wealth. He can just say, look, you can tell that we have some wealth here. And that is because of God. All that would be glorifying God, right? And giving you an opportunity to tell others in an evangelistic way about the one true living God. That's what he could have said. He could have even said, Thank you for your gift about for my healing. Thank you that you were concerned. The whole reason I was healed, though, is because of God. He deserves all the honor, credit, and glory, right? He doesn't do any of that. Should have said, um, I want to live for the approval of God, not man, right? He had so many opportunities here. Verse 3. Here's Isaiah coming. Isaiah to set him straight. Then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah, and he said to him, What's wrong with you? <laughs> he says, What did these men say? Question mark. And from where did they come to you? Question mark. Hezekiah said, They have come to me from a far country, from Babylon. He said, What have they seen in your house? Hezekiah answered, they have seen all that's in my house. There is nothing in my storehouses that I did not show them. We'll see how this comes back to haunt him. This is Isaiah reproving Hezekiah. He's questioning Hezekiah in a sarcastic manner. Right? What did you show them? Well, you had these strange men come into your land. Where were they from? Oh, they were from Babylon. Oh, I see, they're from Babylon. And what did you show them? Oh, I showed them everything. There was nothing that I did not show them. Isaiah knew the answers to these questions. He's reproving Hezekiah through this. No doubt God guided Isaiah in this as well. He wants Hezekiah to see the error by using that sarcasm. But Hezekiah doesn't get it. I mean, his responses come back as if he's proud. Oh, 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 Isaiah, they were from Babylon. Oh, I see, Babylon. Oh, I see. Very nice. Well, what, what did you show them? Oh, Isaiah, I showed them everything. He's proud. He's not hiding it at all. He's proud of what he's done. He's like that small-town boy who is awestruck by it. The first time he sees a big city band coming through, you know, you think back to when the first cars were about and you'd have a guy driving a car going to an old farm community where all they needed were horses and carriages. And all the boys would, oh, right? They're enamored. It was almost like that. Oh, the Babylonians are so impressive. And they actually like me. And they want to hang out with me. So I showed them everything I have in order to make sure they think I'm cool. And this happens in, in small ways every day. Hezekiah's pride and ego made him blind. He never stopped to ask the question, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be serving God. What is it God wants? All he could focus on is what he wanted. Verse 5, Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Again, that's God's military title, Lord of hosts, the commander of all the angelic armies of heaven. Verse 6, Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. You were stupid to show them this. 
This is what the Lord God of hosts says. You can guarantee that one day, all the things that you showed them will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And some of your own sons who will come from you, some of your descendants who come from you, whom you will father, shall be taken away. And they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. This is the result of what you have done. There is no reason for you to be prideful or excited or happy about this. You have committed a great foolish error. Hezekiah thought that, that his display of wealth and everything he was showing the Babylonians would impress them. Instead, all it did was show them, look at all this great stuff we can take. Look at all this awesome stuff. We had no idea you had all this great stuff. And you're weak. We're strong. Why should we not come back and take all your great stuff? All it did was show them what the kings of Judah had and what they could get from them. One day the kings of Babylon would come and take it all away. That was fulfilled under the king of Babylon. You might have heard of him before, Nebuchadnezzar. This is mentioned in 2 Kings verse 20, or chapter 25. It's also mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 24. I'm going to read just a few of these verses to show when this comes to pass. 2 Kings 24. This is verse 10. It talks about Jerusalem being captured. It says, At that time the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up to Jerusalem. So this is in the future from Isaiah. Servants of the king of Babylon came up to Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to the city while the servants were besieging it. And Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, gave himself up to the king of Babylon. And his mother, and his servants, and his officials, and his palace officials. And the king of Babylon took him prisoner in the eighth year of his reign, and carried off all the treasures of the house of the Lord. And the treasures of the king's house were cut into pieces. And all the vessels of gold in the temple of the Lord, which Solomon, king of Israel, had made, as the Lord had foretold. When did the Lord foretell it? Right back in Isaiah 39, as we're reading right now. You can count on God's word always being fulfilled. It might not happen in the time frame that you're thinking or expecting, but it will always happen. Always. It would be more than a hundred years from when Isaiah is speaking this that Babylon would carry all these things and people away. But it happened exactly as God had prophesied through Isaiah. It's so accurate. Again, when, when God prophesies something, it's dead on. Not close. It's not like a horoscope where it's like, you will face difficulty today. Oh, great. Right? Or something new and surprising will happen today. Oh, we're great. You'll meet someone new today. Oh, great. Really vague, right? I mean, that's a wide net. I can bump into somebody at Dollar General. Hey, I met somebody new today. Right? That kind of counts. That's not how God's prophecy works. It's dead on. It's 100% accurate, and it's specific. Ridiculously specific. Worse than taking all the riches that he had shown, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, would take away the king of Judah and his belongings, but, but more importantly, his family. Sons and daughters of Judah. Far more important, right? All of us would say that your children are more important than your financial possessions. One fulfillment of this was taking someone into captivity you might have heard before by the name of Daniel. Daniel was one of the people taken into captivity, prophesied in Isaiah 39 and coming to pass in 2 Kings 24. Daniel was one of the king's descendants taken into the palace of the king of Babylon. Listen to Daniel 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it, and the Lord gave the king of Judah into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, in the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. 
Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in wisdom, endowed with knowledge and understanding and learning, to be competent and stand in the king's palace and to teach them literature and the language of the Chaldeans, which are the Babylonians. There's prophecy being fulfilled in yet another section of Scripture. It's all connected. It's all connected. Second Kings, Second Chronicles, Daniel, all connected to what we're reading in Isaiah. All connected. Because of this promise of God through Isaiah, they were taken. Taken to serve in the palace, just as God predicted. Verse 8 in Isaiah 39. Here's King Hezekiah's response. Verse 8. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, The word of the Lord that you have spoken is good. For he thought, There will be peace and security in my days. Ugh. This is a very sad state of heart in the king of Judah, Hezekiah. God announces judgment is coming. And all he can say is that, well, at least it won't happen in my lifetime. Oh, what? Whew. Wait a minute, Isaiah. You talked about all that judgment, but oh, wait a minute. What a relief. At least it won't happen in my lifetime. Does that not show you the state of his heart? The state of his mind in this moment? If we were talking to someone who was a, a friend of ours or a family member of ours, and we told them that, you know what, in 20 years, uh, 10 years after you pass away, your descendants, your sons and your daughters, are going to go through this horrific thing. If they were to say to you what Hezekiah says to Isaiah, you would doubt their sanity. Wouldn't you? You would think them cruel. You would think them unloving, uncaring, and you would doubt their sanity. You certainly would doubt their faith. Ah, oh, such a sad, sad expression. Hezekiah shows himself to be uh, the exact opposite of a selfless person. Again, who is he focusing on? Himself. Everything he's showing, all the fruit he's showing, is prideful and selfish. He's almost completely self-centered. All he cares about is himself. There's no doubt that Hezekiah started out well, right? Demolishing the pagan idols and temples. He started out well. And overall, his reign had quite a bit of godliness to it, as is talked about in 2 Kings 18. But his beginning was a lot better than his end. He did not finish well. He did not finish well. God gave Hezekiah 15 extra years of life. And he knew it. Because God had said it. God's word's 100% accurate. Golden. Golden standard. But it didn't make him a better man, and it certainly didn't make him more godly. You think that it would, right? We think too highly of ourselves. We think, oh, that, that if my environment was different, I'd be different. If everything was going really good right now, I'd be really good. If, uh, if I knew what was about to happen, or if I knew how many years I had left of life, oh, I'd live on a, on a scale of righteousness heretofore seen never before in the human world. Right? If I, if I knew I had 15 years left, oh, I'd, I'd live like no one's ever lived for the Lord. That's what everybody thinks. Right? It speaks to the depravity of mankind. It speaks to the wickedness of our hearts. People always think it's the environment. Oh, if I had more knowledge, or oh, if I had a better environment. You know when the fall happened? It happened in paradise. The fall happened in paradise. It's not our environment. Adam and Eve sinned in the perfect environment of paradise. It's not the environment. Time, age, and environment doesn't necessarily make us any better. Time comes and goes. It's what you do with it that matters. Hezekiah, did he make good use of the extra time that the Lord gave him? No. Not on a personal level. Certainly no. 
How should we spend our time? It's a good question. What should I do with my time? What's the biblical way? What's the biblical answer of what should I do with my time? I'm a Christian now. That means I'm supposed to be different than the rest of the world. So then, what does God say I should be doing? What does God say I should be doing and how I should be leaving, living? Romans 12 has part of that answer. I'm going to answer this a little bit for you. It's Romans 12, verses 1 through 2. I appeal to you, brothers... I appeal to you, believers, those of you who say that you are disciples and followers of Christ, I appeal to you, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Your bodies, it doesn't say part of your body, your entire body. Everything you do, everything you are, everything you think and say is meant to be a living sacrifice to God. Every day, not just Sunday. Every day, not just when you feel emotional, right? Or when you hear a song on the radio and you're like, oh my gosh, oh, I really gotta live for God. No, all the time is when we're supposed to be doing this. A living sacrifice that's holy and that's acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Everything you say and do, your entire body, your entire thought life, your whole, all your actions, all your words, everything you are is supposed to be a living sacrifice to God, which is your spiritual worship to Him. If you love God and want to worship Him, you do it, not just by singing songs, not just by giving of money or giving of time, but of giving of everything you have. Because guess what you owe God? Everything. He deserves no less. Goes on to say, do not be conformed to this world. Don't do what the world does. How should I spend my time? Living so that everything I'm doing is a form of worship to God. That's how you should spend your time. There is a lot of freedom in that. It's not a lot of rigidity, but there are bumpers on the side to keep you on the straight and narrow, right? Living for God, living for His glory. And living for God and His glory is not a, not a bore. It's not a, oh man, I've got to live for God. Ugh. No. When you do things the right way, which is God's way, it has a, a trickle-down effect, a ripple effect that will make everything else in your life line up and be better. Verse 2 in Romans 12, do not be conformed to this world. Don't do what the world does. Don't think how the world thinks. Don't take what they say is important and agree. Be different. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing, you will be able to discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And perfect. Today, this afternoon, this evening, tomorrow, you do what we're talking about in all your choices and in all your priorities. Then when you face all your decisions of the day, you spiritually discern what the will of God is in that decision. That's, that way you spiritually discern what is good and acceptable and perfect. How do you do that? How do I discern what God wants in each and every situation that I go through? The situation I'll go through when I leave church today, the situation I'll go through tonight, the situation I go through tomorrow morning, with people around me, by myself, at work. The answer is, you get a transformed mind. How do I discern God's will? You get a transformed mind. How do you get a transformed mind? Right? This is just like a formula, a mathematical formula. How do I discern what God's perfect will is and what he wants me to do? I get a transformed mind. How do I get a transformed mind? Prayer. Study and labor in the word of God. Because that's where he tells us his will. This is not, this is not a punishment. <laughs> when you want to strengthen a muscle, you work it, right? You put forth the effort. And by doing so, that muscle gets stronger. It is the same with prayer and with study in the Word of God. 
We're very fortunate today to have many different avenues of being able to study the Word of God. You have a hard time reading, there's audio. You have a hard time with reading and audio, there's video. You have a hard time with all that, you can go to a good pastor who will sit down with you one-on-one, -on -one, and I guarantee you, if you have a real man of God, that he will gladly take the time to labor with you in Scripture. When you have to choose this or that, when there's something that's in your mind that you have to discern what God wants, how Christ could be magnified, where faith can be built, where people can be loved. It's the Word of God itself that's the most helpful in doing those things. And then you use the Word of God in conjunction with prayer to be able to do it, to glorify God and to build up and edify His church. If you were to be asked by a friend, hey, I saw you do this, or I saw you do that, and they say, why did you go and do that? One of the benefits of doing what we're talking about is you'd be able to go right to Scripture and say, this is why. Why did you give that person that, that you know, you went and put this card in somebody's mailbox, knowing that they're hard up on money, but you didn't, you didn't sign it, you didn't do it. Why did you do that? That's weird. Why would you want them to know that he gave it? And then you would say, hey, don't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. You'd quote scripture. Or you'd say, the Lord loves a cheerful giver, and I just don't want to have anybody, I don't need the glory, I want God to get the glory, and he rewards what he sees in secret. Right? You go to scripture. This is why I did what I did. And guess what that does? It does what Hezekiah doesn't do, didn't do. Glorifies God. Points to God. Points the person who's asking the questions to God. It's great. It's great. And that's one way to make sure that you're making the most out of the time that God gives you. You don't want, in Ephesians 5, it talks about the waking, O oh, sleeper, right? Wake up. Live your life for God. You only have, you don't know how much time you have. We're not King Hezekiah. We don't know how many years we have left. So you don't want to end poorly. We want to be running across the finish line at the best pace yet and end well to fight the good fight of faith. And to hear those precious words from our Lord and Savior, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what we want. So we have to wake ourselves up because the society around us, the world around us, doesn't want the same thing. But that's where we spend the majority of our time. So you end up becoming kind of low, like a siren call, into the same thing. Wake up, oh sleeper. Don't get lulled into the same thing that the society and culture is doing around you. We're not part of that. We're in the world, but not of the world. We transform our minds. We live our entire life as the, that is our worship of God. How do you worship God? It's not a single moment. It's not a single action. It's all your moments and all your actions and all your thoughts. It's everything. Goes on to say, after that, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, in Ephesians 5, Paul says, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of your time because the days are evil. Yes. Absolutely true. Are we using the time that God has given us to its best? I'm constantly asking that question. Constantly. I never feel satisfied, right? Because I always see opportunity where I could be better. Oh, I could be doing this more. I could be doing that more. But the ultimate question is, am I glorifying God? Who am I doing this for? Why am I doing this? Am I doing, you know, ultimately, am I doing it for God's will? Or am I doing it for my own? Good questions for all of us to continue to ask ourselves. It's not a one-time thing. This is a daily thing. Just like repentance. Repentance isn't a one-time thing. It's a daily thing. Faith is not a one-day thing. It's an everyday thing. Right? And so these are good questions to ask ourselves. How am I using my time? And am I, am I really, 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 really using my time for God? Or am I using it for myself? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today's word. Please help us. Help us to not be like King Hezekiah. It is an overwhelming temptation to use the time that you have graced us with 
for ourselves. And it becomes such a natural thing to us that, that subconsciously we don't even notice. And consciously we don't even notice. We're, but every once in a while, Lord, it's like you send a signal to us through your word or, or some other way to wake us up, to call us to more, more than what this life is, more to what more than what modern day Christianity is, which is just a farce. Lord, we want biblical Christianity. We want to grow in Christ-likeness. We want to grieve over our sins and yearn for your righteousness. We want to continue to get more and more sanctified in your word. We want to be able to look back a year from now and see just how much we've grown in Christ-likeness. We need your help with the temptation to just continue to live life the same way, the same old way. Let's not be satisfied with that. But help us live lives that are marked by faithfulness. Let us all be called faithful. And to be able to, to do that, we need your help. Because we certainly cannot do that on our own. So please help us use the best of our time. Transform our hearts and our minds. Renew our spirit. And guide us in the way that we should go every day. And we know that in little, little ways, you can put a brick on top of a brick and eventually it reaches... And God bless you and keep you all. Remember these next few days that our focus is on Christ, our Savior, who is Lord, our God, our King, our Savior. And remember that, and may He bless you in the sense that everything that, as you remember that He was born for us, that that will bear in you or make born in you that every thought, every deed, everything that you do is for Him. So God bless you and keep you. Good day.